Hello lovelies, in this video Dr. Abbott and I are going to be team teaching you the whole of OCR A module 3, that is exchange and transport. Now there is a lot of detail in this video, so if you're looking for something specific you can use the timestamps, you can use the chapters to jump to that bit, or if you're watching this just before the exam and you want a quick recap on everything, you can put it on two times speed to get through everything faster. Don't forget, there is loads of stuff over on my website for you. And if you're looking for a bit of help with the exam technique, then you can go and watch the predictive paper video walkthroughs that Dr. Edwards has produced for this year's exam. Surface area to volume ratio. Cells need to move things around from A to B, generally across a partially permeable membrane. There are certain ways that we can take a short distance, here in purple, and actually fit quite a lot of membrane on it. The more membrane there is, the more opportunities there are for things to diffuse across. One example would be cells need to take in oxygen and need carbon dioxide removed. Nutrients need to be moved to the correct location. Urea needs to be excreted. And heat needs to be evenly distributed. To ensure that this exchange is as effective as possible, the surface area needs to be as large as possible in comparison to the volume. Smaller organisms have a larger surface area to volume ratio. It takes a long time for substances to move from the outside to the inside of a larger organism. This is why large organisms, bigger than a single cell or flatworms, very, very small organisms, they need an internal exchange system for things, which reduces the distance and increases the rate of diffusion to make sure that all the substances get into all of the cells as fast as possible. Here we can use cubes as an example. We're going to look at a large animal and a small animal. This large animal has a surface area of 86 centimetres squared and a volume of 48 centimetres cubed. Dividing this gives us a surface area to volume ratio of 1.8. A small animal, represented by one cube, will have a surface area of 6 centimetres squared, 1 centimetre cubed. So the surface area to volume ratio here is 6, which is much higher than 1.8. The smaller animal has a larger surface area to volume ratio. A few maths hints to take note of here that there are no units for a ratio. If the question is talking about cells, think sphere and use 4 pi r squared. For a circle, it is pi r squared. Or for a cylinder, it is 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. All exchange systems have the same three adaptations in common. These all help to increase the rate of substance exchange inside organisms. They have thin walls to create short diffusion distances. They have a large surface area to increase the amount of membrane or surface that's in contact with the substances that need to be exchanged. They have a good blood or air supply, which we call ventilation, to maintain concentration gradients. All of these are obviously 
factors that affect the rate of diffusion, and that's really what we're talking about here. So some examples are the fact that leaves are thin, so there's a short distance between the air and the inside of the leaf. We've got the folds of villi in the small intestine, which increase surface area, and structures like the alveoli, which have lots of capillaries around them, which is a form of good blood supply, which will help maintain the concentration gradient. So as we go through this topic and the rest of these slides, you'll notice these same features coming up again and again, because these are adaptations for gas exchange or digestion and the movement of substances across membranes. The respiratory system is where gas exchange in humans takes place. We have the alveoli. These are tiny little air sacs right at the end of the system. They are surrounded by collagen and lined with epithelium. We have bronchioles. These are subdivisions of the bronchi. They have walls made of muscles. The bronchi are two subdivisions of the trachea. And the trachea, this is made from cartilage to protect it. The ribcage has a protective function. Overall, this is contained in the lungs, the large structure where you'll find all the alveoli and bronchioles. The diaphragm moves up and down to draw air in and out. And all of these work together. So if we follow the pathway of air as it moves into the lungs, it would follow the nose and the mouth, then into the trachea, then into the bronchi, then into the bronchioles, then into the alveoli, and then across the alveolar epithelium, across the capillary endothelium, and then into the blood. This is obviously the journey for oxygen, and this would be reversed if we were talking about the diffusion and movement of carbon dioxide as it leaves the lungs. When we think about the mechanics of breathing, we need to compare breathing in with breathing out. This can also be referred to as inspiration and expiration. Breathing in is an active process that requires energy. The external intercostal muscles contract. The internal intercostal muscles relax. The diaphragm contracts. The volume of the lungs increase. The pressure within the lungs decreases. And subsequently, air is forced in. Conversely, breathing out is a passive process. The external intercostal muscles relax, the internal intercostal muscles contract, the diaphragm relaxes, the ribs move in a down and inwards direction, the volume decreases, the pressure within the lungs increases and subsequently air is forced out. Here we can see the alveolar epithelium. This is where gas exchange in the lungs takes place. These are tiny air sacs, approximately 100 to 300 micrometers in diameter, but with a total combined surface area spanning tens of meters squared. We have the alveolus cavity, the epithelial cells, the capillary surrounding it, and the air inside. Oxygen-rich air will move into the lungs, to the alveoli, down a pressure gradient. Red blood cells in capillaries will slow as they move around the alveoli. Oxygen will then diffuse down its concentration gradient. From the alveolus cavity, across two layers of epithelial cells into the bloodstream. Red blood cells are flattened against the capillary walls. 
to reduce the distance needed for diffusion. Carbon dioxide follows the opposite pathway. The movement of air in and out of the lungs maintains the concentration gradient. We need to think about our three factors that are adaptations to efficient gas exchange for the lungs as well. So many alveoli is the reason that we have this large surface area. The narrowness of capillaries and the fact that they cause blood vessels to slow down as they move around the alveoli increases the diffusion time. The thin walls of both the capillaries and the alveoli, which means we only have to go through two layers of epithelial cells, one cell layer for each, reduces the diffusion distance. The constant ventilation of air in and out of the lungs maintains the concentration gradient, but also the alveoli having lots of capillaries providing a good blood supply also maintains the concentration gradient. Measuring lung volumes. We can measure lung volume using a spirometer attached to a data logger. The whole of this graph, so the vital capacity and the residual volume, represents the total lung capacity. However, only vital capacity can be measured with the spirometer. Residual volume cannot be measured with the spirometer. The vital capacity is the maximum volume of air in and out in one breath. It can be affected by various factors, including size, especially height, age, gender, and your regular exercise level. The residual volume is the volume of air that remains in the lungs even after forced expiration. It helps to prevent your collapse of your airways and alveoli. The tidal volume is the volume of air moved in and out in each breath at rest. This should provide enough oxygen for all of your tissues at rest. A spirometer can be used to trace and calculate oxygen uptake because the carbon dioxide that's being exhaled is going to be being absorbed by soda lime in the machine. So the volume overall in the machine will decrease. The decrease in volume represents the volume of carbon dioxide that's being exhaled, which can be analogous to the volume of oxygen that's absorbed into the blood. The trace can also be used to measure breathing rate. This is done by counting the number of peaks of the tidal volume in a set amount of time. The oxygen uptake will increase with increased breathing rate or increased tidal volume, so deeper breathing. Gas exchange in insects using a grasshopper as an example. They have a small series of tubes called tracheals. These extend the whole way throughout the insect's body. Air is brought directly to the tissue, allowing for a short diffusion distance. Gases will move according to their diffusion gradients. This is helped by the rhythmic movement of the insect's abdominal muscles to move air in and out. Gas enters and leaves the system via spiracles on the surface of the insect. These open and close via a valve. Gas exchange in fish gills is something you hopefully looked at in class. While dissecting a fish gill might be one of the smellier practicals that you do, it really helps you to see how the gill filaments separate out when they appear in water compared to when they're in the air. The same three rules apply that we've mentioned a lot already. The gill filaments and having many of them creates a large surface area. They have a good blood supply or lots of capillaries, which helps to maintain the concentration gradient. And they have thin walls, which helps to reduce the diffusion distance. If we look closely at a single gill filament, we can see there is deoxygenated blood on one half and then oxygenated blood on the other. This is a single gill filament. 
blood will flow in this direction and water will flow in the opposing direction. This counter current system maintains a constant gradient. The important thing to note here is that this counter current system maintaining this concentration gradient is what makes sure the diffusion happens across the whole length of the gill filament. Gas exchange tissues. One of the main tissues that lines the airway of the gas exchange system is ciliated epithelium. It contains two types of cells. Ciliated epithelial cells, which have cilia, which move mucus, and goblet cells, which secrete the mucus. This mucus is important because it traps dust, dirt, and pathogens, and the cilia are necessary in order to sweep that mucus away so that it can be removed from the body. Cartilage is another tissue in the exchange system. It provides support and prevents the airways collapsing. It is strong, but also flexible. Elastic tissue is needed so that the lungs can expand when they fill with air, but also the elastic nature of the tissues allows them to recoil, which helps to force air back out during exhalation. Smooth muscle layers allow airways to contract, and this can control the diameter of the airways, which allows control of airflow. So when the smooth muscle layers contract, the airways are narrowed, and when the smooth muscle layers relaxed, the airways are dilated. This allows an increase in airflow during exercise, for example. We need to be able to recognise different structures in the lungs by looking at a cross section of them and identifying the different tissues. The trachea in cross section can be identified by a piece of smooth muscle next to a C-shaped ring of cartilage, then there is a layer of elastic tissue, and then lining the airway is ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. Cross section of the bronchus. This time the external layer is smooth muscle with small pieces of cartilage within it. It is not a C-shaped ring. Then we have our layer of elastic tissue again, and then again lining the airway is the ciliated epithelium, with, go with goblet cells. A bronchial cross section, so this is one of the smaller tubes. This is more simple, the outer layer is smooth muscle with some elastic fibres embedded, and then we have ciliated epithelium lining the airway, but this time there are very few goblet cells. Lastly, you need to be able to recognise an alveolus in cross section, so this is the diagram of what we normally see. There is a layer outside that is elastic tissue, and then there is the alveolar epithelium. The alveolar epithelium is different from the ciliated epithelium. It is squamous epithelium, so it's thin, one cell thick, but there are no cilia and no goblet cells. Types of circulatory system. We need to be able to explain the difference between single and double circulatory systems. In a single circulatory system, blood only passes through the heart once. This can be seen as an example in fish. Blood leaves the heart and goes to the gills to pick up oxygen, then it goes to the body and then back to the heart. So there is no pump that actually pushes the oxygenated blood from the gills to the body. This means that pressure is low and the rate of exchange of substances is also low. In a double circulatory system, blood flows through the heart twice, once to the lungs and then once to the body. Because there is this extra step where the oxygenated blood is pumped from the heart back around to the body, pressure is higher and there is a higher rate of exchange. We also need to be able to explain the difference between an open circulatory system and a closed circulatory system. In an open circulatory system, blood is not enclosed in vessels all the time. It can flow th freely through the body cavity. This can be seen in insects and other invertebrates. This system is obviously quite slow because there is low pressure. 
This means that in insects, they use it to transport nutrients only, not oxygen. They have a different system of tubes to transport oxygen. In a closed circulatory system, like in mammals, including humans, the blood travels around inside vessels entirely. Instead of direct exchange between the fluid and the tissues, substances are exchanged through the walls of the capillaries. And because of this system, both oxygen and nutrients can be transported because the pressure can be maintained and therefore the rate of exchange is higher. We have a closed double circulatory system. It is a double circulatory system because the heart will pump to the lungs and the heart will pump to the rest of the body. The heart, the pump, is needed due to a low surface area to volume ratio. The benefit of having a double pump also helps to increase the pressure and therefore the speed of the delivery of oxygen to all of the cells and tissues. Not all organisms have this double pump and so their circulatory system will be slightly less efficient and a bit slower. As well as the blood vessels to and from the heart, you need to know that the renal artery and the renal vein are the main blood vessels that serve the kidney. And remember the heart has its own coronary arteries that feed the heart muscle. Whenever you see a heart, right, right and left on the correct opposite sides, just to remind you when you are labeling things. Blood will enter through the vena cava and exit to the lungs. It will come in from the lungs via the pulmonary vein and then exit via the aorta to the rest of the body. The path that blood takes, I'm going to teach you a little trick to help you remember it. So it comes in through the vena cava to the right atrium, then down to the right ventricle, out to the lungs via the pulmonary artery, back to the heart via the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, down to the left ventricle, and out to the rest of the body via the aorta. Now I've written them like this so you can see the pattern. It goes V, A, V, A, V, A, V, A. If your flow of blood does not follow that, for example, if you've got two A's next to each other or if you've got two V's next to each other, either you've mislabeled something or you've drawn the path wrong. There are three main types of blood vessels that you need to know about. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Arterioles are smaller arteries. These help the blood vessels to contract, which can control the flow of blood and also help to withstand the high pressure. Skid up walls. A thick elastic layer. The elastic layer helps the blood vessels to stretch and recoil, which allows them to maintain blood pressure. Which is needed to keep the blood pressure high. And they have no valves. Veins carry blood towards the heart. They have thin muscular and elastic walls. The elastic muscle layers are thinner in veins because pressure is reduced. Valves at regular intervals to stop the blood flowing backwards. And capillaries. These carry blood to the organs and they allow exchange to take place. They are one layer of cells thick. The one layer of cell thick walls creates a short diffusion distance for substances. They are highly branched and very narrow to allow for the rapid diffusion of gases, nutrients and ions into and out of the bloodstream. Being highly branched slows down the blood flow as well as being narrow, allowing for greater time to be given for diffusion. At capillary bleds, we need to be able to explain how tissue fluid is formed. At the arterial end, high hydrostatic pressure is caused by ventricular contraction. This 
forces out plasma and dissolve substances through the walls of the capillary. Large plasma proteins and red blood cells stay behind in the capillary because they are too big to pass through the walls. This reduces the water potential of blood and because we've lost liquid or fluid, we also have decreased the volume of blood. This means at the venial end of the capillary, water potential is higher, which creates a higher osmotic pressure than the hydrostatic pressure because we've lost volume and therefore lower hydrostatic pressure. This high osmotic pressure forces water to return to the blood by osmosis from the tissue fluid. Any excess fluid that does not return to the capillary is drained into the lymphatic system through lacteals or lymphatic capillaries. For required practical five, we are going to be looking at the dissection of an organ within a mass transport system, in this case, the heart. If you want to see all of the gory details, then you can go and watch my heart dissection video. But here, we're just going to use an image. Within the heart, you should be able to find the aorta, the vena cava, the pulmonary artery going to the lungs, the pulmonary vein coming from the lungs, the left ventricle and left atrium, as well as the right ventricle and the right atrium. Notice I've written right and left as the first thing whenever I see a heart diagram. We have deoxygenated blood coming in through the vena cava, in to the atrium, down to the ventricle and then being pumped out via the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Oxygenated blood will come back from the lungs via the pulmonary vein, in to the left atrium, down to the left ventricle and then pumped around the rest of the body via the aorta. When looking at the heart, you will find valves. These are very thin but very strong. These open and close to control the direction of blood flow. The walls of the ventricle are much thicker. However, on the left-hand side of the heart, they are noticeably thicker than on the right-hand side. This is because instead of the right-hand side just has a pump to the lungs, the left-hand side has to pump the whole way round to the body. So instead of just pumping to the lungs, it pumps to the whole body and needs to be a thicker muscle. There are distinct parts to the cardiac cycle. In diastole, the heart relaxes. Blood will enter the heart via the pulmonary vein and vena cava. As the atria fill up, there is an increase in pressure. When atrial pressure is higher than ventricular pressure, the valves open and blood begins to flow from the atria to the ventricles. In systole, contraction of the atrial walls moves the rest of the blood down towards the ventricles. After the ventricles have filled up, the walls will contract. Ventricular pressure increases and the atrioventricular valves close. This further increases the pressure and blood is forced into the aorta and pulmonary artery. The aortic pressure rises as blood is forced in and then falls as the blood leave. Ventricular pressure is low at first and then rises. This rises quickly after the valves close. Then falls as blood is forced into the aorta and pulmonary artery. Atrial pressure is always low-ish as the walls are very thin and this drops when the valves open. Ventricular volume increases as the atria contracts and they fill with blood. It then drops as the blood moves to the aorta and pulmonary artery. We can look at cardiac output as a calculation of stroke volume multiplied by heart rate.
Control of heartbeat starts with the sinoatrial node. This generates electrical impulses and it initiates a wave of excitation at regular intervals. It's sometimes known as the pacemaker. The wave of excitation from the sinoatrial node causes the atria to contract and squeeze blood into the ventricles. The wave of excitation stimulates the atrioventricular node. It is the only way that the wave of excitation can continue down into the septum to reach the ventricles. There is a delay in the response of the atrioventricular node, which allows the atrium to contract and finish pushing blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. The AV node is connected to the bundle of His, which is a group of muscle fibres which conduct the wave of excitation down into the perkine fibres. The perkine fibres are tissues which carry the wave of electrical activity down through the septum and to the ventricles. This signal causes the ventricles to contract and it happens from the apex upwards to the very tip of the bottom of the heart upwards, which causes the ventricles to push blood out of the arteries. Electrocardiograms. Electrocardiograms can be measured using an electrocardiograph. This is sometimes known as an ECG, and it records the changes in electrical activity in the heart. The trace of these electrical activities always looks the same and follows the same pattern. There is a P wave, which represents the atrial contraction. There is a QRS wave, which represents the ventricle contraction. And there is a T wave, which represents the relaxation of the heart. The shape of an ECG trace can indicate if there is problems with different parts of the heart. Normal heartbeat is sometimes called sinus rhythm, can be seen in the top chart. A faster than normal heartbeat above 120 beats per minute is known as tachycardia. A slower than normal heartbeat is known as bradycardia. And an irregular heartbeat can sometimes be called an ectopic heartbeat, which the patient would feel skipping or fluttering of the heart. Tachycardia at rest is an issue because it shows that the heart is not pumping blood efficiently around the body. Bradycardia is a heartbeat that is slower than 50 beats per minute. It suggests an electrical activity issue. So for example, the signal not being passed from the SAN correctly. An ectopic heartbeat is mostly no problem, but if it becomes really irregular, it's known as fibrillation and it can cause fainting, chest pain, and potentially death. Hemoglobin in humans consists of four polypeptide chains. This is a protein's quaternary structure. They have heme groups which contain iron two ions in, and the heme groups are the part that actually combines with oxygen. Hemoglobin will combine with four oxygen molecules in a reversible reaction. Oxygen will readily associate with hemoglobin and readily dissociate with it. Meaning that hemoglobin can change its affinity for oxygen in different conditions. This is done by changing shape when other substances are present. This will happen at gas exchange surfaces. For example, in the lungs, there is a high oxygen concentration and a low carbon dioxide concentration. We say this means there is a high partial pressure of oxygen. Meaning there will be a high affinity for oxygen and oxygen will load. At respiring tissue in the body, there will be a low oxygen concentration a high carbon dioxide concentration. This means there is a low partial pressure of oxygen. There will be a low affinity and oxygen will dissociate. You need to be able to interpret and sketch oxygen dissociation curves.
at point A on this curve. It is very hard for the first oxygen molecule to bind. So at low oxygen concentrations, very little oxygen will actually bind. For example, this could be within respiring tissues. At point B, after the first oxygen binds, the shape of the quaternary structure changes, making it easier for subsequent oxygens to bind. We can see this as if it's only a small increase in partial pressure, whereas a steeper gradient happens at this part of the graph. There is positive cooperation. At point C, after the third oxygen molecule binds, it is harder to bind the fourth and the last oxygen. To talk about with this graph is the Bohr effect. So the concentration of carbon dioxide can also affect the loading of oxygen onto hemoglobin. If there is a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, for example in the lungs, the affinity of hemoglobin is increased. Within the lungs, there is a high concentration of oxygen. So oxygen is readily loaded onto hemoglobin. Where there is a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, for example in muscles or respiring tissue, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is lowered. This could be in the muscles, so oxygen easily dissociates and goes to where it's needed. When affinity for hemoglobin is lower, we say the graph is shifted to the right. This is why this is sometimes known as the Bohr shift. And sometimes you'll be asked to explain this difference. And the wording we need to use here is by saying that at the same partial pressure of oxygen, there is a lower affinity of hemoglobin, which means that there is less or lower percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen because more oxygen is dissociated from the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin isn't the same in all animals. I have a little bit of a soft spot for horseshoe crabs because when I worked in America for a few summers, it was in a lab that kept horseshoe crabs. And you'd have your gas tap, you'd have your water tap, and you'd have your salt water tap for the horseshoe crabs. Anyway, the reason they are so interesting in science is because they have blue blood because they use copper instead of iron in their haemoglobin. So differences in genetic code can lead to differences in quaternary structure of haemoglobin. Thus, different animals will have differences in oxygen affinity. This is one example of adaptation to an environment. There can be variances based on size. Smaller animals will have a higher surface area to volume ratio. Thus they lose heat quickly. So we'll have a high oxygen affinity. This is because they have a higher metabolic rate in order to keep warm. If an animal lives in a low oxygen environment, it needs hemoglobin with a high oxygen affinity. If an animal has high activity levels, it needs to be able to quickly dissociate oxygen. So the hemoglobin needs a lower oxygen affinity. You need to be able to recognize the differences in these graphs when we have these different hemoglobins or different environments. So I always try and use this way to remember it. So low oxygen environment will be in a left shift on the graph. 
So from the normal dissociation curve, we have a left shift because we've got l low O2 concentration. The example of this that is one of the most common is fetal hemoglobin. So fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen, which it needs to, because otherwise, at the same partial pressure of oxygen, the oxygen would not dissociate from the mother's hemoglobin and associate with the fetal hemoglobin. So it needs to have a higher affinity than adult hemoglobin because otherwise oxygen would not transfer from the mother's blood to the fetus's blood in the placenta. As we said, this was low oxygen environment, so left shift. So the other example is animals that live either at high altitude, so up in the mountains, where there is a low partial pressure of oxygen, or in a low oxygen environment, such as in sand, for example, where they aren't getting a lot of ventilation or flow of air or water. This again ensures there's enough oxygen that's going to bind to their hemoglobin, even at low concentrations of oxygen, to make sure they get enough to survive. The opposite graph shift is when the graph shifts to the right. So we can remember this by saying right shift means high respiration. So high respiration, r, right shift. It ensures that when there's more respiration occurring, so there's going to be a high carbon dioxide concentration, more oxygen will be released to help maintain high metabolic rates. So this is the example, like we said, for small organisms that have a high metabolic rate, they'll be doing more respiration, and so they will need more oxygen to dissociate, even at low partial pressures of oxygen. Hemoglobin in humans, carbon dioxide transport. The Bohr shift can be explained by showing how carbon dioxide affects blood pH. Carbon dioxide enters red blood cells and reacts with water to form carbonic acid. This is catalyzed by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. The carbonic acid then splits into hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. These go on to do two different things. The increased concentration of hydrogen ions causes the oxygen to dissociate from the hemoglobin. This is so that the hydrogen ions can bind to hemoglobin instead to form hemoglobinic acid. This is a safety feature as it prevents the cell from becoming too acidic. It basically mops up the extra hydrogen plus ions. The hydrogen carbonate ions instead, they are transported out into the blood plasma. In order to compensate from this loss of negative ions, chloride ions move in from the plasma. This is known as the chloride shift. This happens to about 90% of the carbon dioxide in red blood cells, but the rest, about 10%, binds directly to the haemoglobin and is transported to the lungs that way. At the lungs, the low partial pressure of carbon dioxide causes the hydrogen carbonate ions and the H plus ions to recombine. They form water and carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide then diffuses into the alveoli and then is breathed out. Gas exchange in plants. Plants need to exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide and water and this all needs to be done via bad leaves. The balance of photosynthesis and respiration creates concentration gradients. So these diffuse into and out of the leaf depending on which is happening at a faster rate. Transpiration is the evaporation of water vapour from the leaves through the stomata. This also moves down its concentration gradient. Guard cells control the opening and the closing of stomata. Stomata are generally on the underside of leaves. There are internal connecting air spaces that will allow the rapid diffusion of gases. This is because they create a large surface area around the edges of the cell membranes that's in contact with the air. 
The opening and closing of stomata controls the rate of diffusion of gases and water. Water will move around the plant via the xylem. Water will enter plants via the roots and needs to move around the plant to where it is needed. Evaporation of water from the leaves creates a force that pulls water up via the xylem. This is a passive process. Hydrogen bonds between water molecules ensure cohesion and thus a continuous flow of water across the mesophyll cells and the xylem. Transpiration pull means the xylem is under pressure. If this is broken and air enters the xylem, then this pull is also broken. The way water moves through the xylem in a plant is known as the cohesion tension theory. Cohesion because of the cohesion between water molecules which creates this unbroken column of water and tension, which is the force that's applied to this unbroken column of water that's created by the water potential gradient. As water is being lost from the leaves, it needs to be replaced. You need to be able to explain the factors that can affect the rate of transpiration. Increasing light intensity increases transpiration rate. This is because more stomata open due to more photosynthesis occurring at higher light intensities. Increasing temperature also increases transpiration rate. This is because water particles will have more kinetic energy, so it is easier for them to evaporate. Increasing wind or air movement also increases transpiration rate. This is because the water particles are being blown away from stomata and they reduce the water potential gradient between the inside of the leaf and the outside air. Increasing humidity decreases transpiration rate. This is because it reduces the water potential gradient because water vapor will be in high concentration in air around the stomata, so the difference between the inside of the leaf and the outside of the leaf is reduced. We can measure transpiration how well the xylem is working with a photometer. An air bubble is introduced and we can follow that movement and measure the movement of the air bubble. The stem of the plant needs to be cut underwater so that we don't introduce any air bubbles and the mean volume of water loss can be calculated. A few variables you could change in this experiment are humidity, temperature, light intensity, and air movement or wind. Remember, this experiment is only an estimate of transpiration rate because it is assuming that all water taken up by the shoot is being transpired. The movement of water through plants. There are two main pathways that water can take through plant cells. The first is the symplast pathway. This is where water moves through the cytoplasm of cells. It moves through the plasma desmata, which have gaps in the cell wall that connect the cytoplasm of neighbouring cells. In this pathway, the water moves by osmosis. The second is the apoplast pathway. In this pathway, water moves through the cell walls. Water can diffuse through cell walls, but it can also move down a pressure gradient. So this is an example of mass flow. In roots, water has to move slightly differently. There is a cortex layer, and then there is an endodermis layer of cells. When water reaches this endodermis layer of cells, it has to stop moving through the apoplast pathway and has to switch to the symplast pathway. This is due to the Kasparian strip 
which is a waterproof strip in the cell walls. So it can no longer diffuse through this section. And this Caspiron strip is only present in the layer of the endodermis. This is an advantage because it forces water to move through the plasma membrane, which means that it can control what substances can or can't enter the xylem. The phloem is responsible for the transportation of inorganic ions from the roots and sugars produced by photosynthesis to wherever they are needed. We say the flow is from source to sink. The best theory we have for this at the moment is the mass flow theory. Sucrose is actively loaded into sieve tube elements. This creates a low water potential in phloem at the source and causes water to move in by osmosis from the xylem. This increase in volume creates high hydrostatic pressure. Mass flow of solutes then occurs down the pressure gradient to sinks where sucrose is being used up. This is a very brief summary of the mass flow theory. Remember, if you want more detail, go to the topic video. There is some evidence for this. Sieve tubes are under pressure. There is a concentration gradient. Another piece of evidence is that ATP is needed for the active loading of sucrose into the sieve tube elements. If ATP production is stopped or respiration is inhibited, then mass flow also stops. Another final piece of evidence is that mass flow increases in daylight, especially from the leaves down the phloem. And this is clearly due to more photosynthesis producing more sucrose in the leaves and creating that pressure gradient. And there is some evidence against this. Not all solutes move at the same rate, and a sieve, by its structure, would appear to be a barrier to movement. Gas exchange in zeophytic plants is slightly different. These need to control water loss. Plants can be adapted for hot environments, cold or dry environments, or very windy environments. In all of these, loss of water is an issue. They could have hairs on the epidermis to trap water, a thick or waxy cuticle, curved or rolled up leaves, the stomata could be in pits or grooves, or there could be fewer stomata. They could also have a reduced surface area to volume ratio. These adaptations reduce transpiration by either reducing the effect of wind, such as curving or rolling up the leaves, or having your stomata in pits or grooves, or they can increase humidity and therefore reduce the water potential gradient, which reduces evaporation, such as hairs on the epidermis to trap water. The other adaptations reduce evaporation opportunities. So a thick waxy cuticle is waterproof, so no water evaporates, and fewer stomata mean there are less holes for water to leave. Ouch! This is why in some videos I explain scratches. <laughs>